so i think some of the slides uh, might have overlap with uh, the uh, the prior presentations in which case uh, i'll move uh, forward faster actually right so the focus of uh, I, i mean we have two sessions uh, in the first session i'll focus on uh, computational network science especially computing uh, centrality measures and the ranking mechanisms uh, right uh, using the traditional approach and i'll try to uh, highlight uh, some of the um inadequacies of uh, these uh, ranking mechanisms in some scenarios right and then motivate the need for uh, game theoretic approaches right to calculate these ranking mechanisms for certain class of problems right and uh, give uh, the uh, the gist of things to follow in order to calculate uh, game theoretic uh, centrality measures or game theoretic ranking mechanisms that is the focus of the first talk and uh, after the break the second talk the focus uh, will be on uh, viral marketing right uh, in other words uh, uh, calculating the influential nodes in a given network is this topic covered the second one viral marketing <coughs> influence maximization okay so we'll cover that in the second session and uh, there is a third session also uh, i think a practice session or uh, programming session whatever you call it so uh, so i have given uh, a coding uh, exercise which consists of about uh, i think 10 or 11 questions um using uh, python's network x package you are supposed to uh, code uh, it requires uh, i mean it's very very basic right it requires uh, discrete mathematics concepts uh, with respect to graph models right um, anyway we will come to that so that is the organization of today's sessions right let's get started with the first one again i'll reiterate the focus of this first session is to briefly look at some of the ranking mechanisms for networks and uh, highlight the limitations of existing approaches right and then uh, give the motivation for game theoretic approach for calculating ranking mechanisms for certain class of problems right let me get started so uh, this is the like overall presentation structure like introduction to networks and then uh, i'll highlight some key tasks in network analysis uh, and uh, the third one is like uh, i'll highlight some of uh, the emerging challenges to uh, bring out the fact that uh, uh, that the computational aspects of solving the problems right several problems in networks is like really challenging due to various reasons right uh, and then get into the game theoretic aspects but some of these things i can move forward faster because uh, you might have like a uh, uh some of these things might have been covered by the other speakers so i don't think uh, this basics are required anymore you know what are networks and how to represent networks you know right a uh, social network can be represented using a graph model wherein graph consists of uh, two entities nodes and edges depending on the context nodes might represent the set of friends or set of publications or set of blogs and things like that edges represent connections among individuals or citations Uh, uh, one paper citing the other right so these kind of uh, links <coughs> yeah so uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, primer on network analysis so what is uh, social network analysis study of the structural patterns among the uh, entities in the network uh, is broadly called as social network analysis so it has like a two uh, uh, a uh, major bins or categories node or edge centric analysis so here the focus will be uh, either a single node or a single edge any arbitrary single node any arbitrary single edge right for that either uh, either we calculate their rankings or uh, we classify that node or edge as anomaly right things like that the second uh, uh, category of social network analysis is network centric analysis here as opposed to the first scenario the focus will be rather a subset of nodes or a subset of edges examples of this category include community detection graph visualization frequent subgraph mining and things like that so any task that you consider in sna social network analysis can belong to uh, or ideally would belong to one of these two buckets <clears throat> so i would like to now show a list of uh, problems i think some of these things uh, would have been covered by the uh, uh, speakers so far in this uh, uh, workshop so 
measures to rank nodes. It is also called as uh, popularly known as centrality measures or uh, ranking mechanisms for networks in CS literature. And then community detection, link prediction problem, uh, <coughs> inferring or constructing networks given a collection of events, right? Uh, viral marketing, graph visualization, right? Uh, network formation, sparsification of large networks into uh, uh, small sparse networks, right? These are all like some exam, I mean, uh, uh, some representative list of tasks or problems that are very, very popular or well studied in the area of social network analysis. By no means, this is not the complete list, right, uh, for social network analysis. So, <coughs> Um, so, I have some slides uh, wherein it describes uh, some of these tasks. So, did, uh, are you aware of the centrality measures, right? Okay. So, the, there are some popular centrality measures like uh, uh, degree centrality, closeness centrality, clustering coefficient, between centrality, eigenvector centrality. These are all like very, very classical uh, centrality measures are ranking mechanisms. The purpose of these centrality measures is it, they essentially attach a score or a number to every node or an edge, right? Every edge in the given network. <coughs> so, uh, do you want me to cover the specifics of some of these uh, centrality measures or uh, you are familiar? What is uh, between a centrality? Between a centrality, for example, um, uh, uh, if you have two nodes, uh, between a centrality is uh, an attribute of an edge, right? Than <laughs> yeah, it can be calculated for edges or nodes. So, for example, if I have an edge, then the number of shortest paths which pass through that edge is uh, between edge. You are almost there, but not uh, exactly that right, actually. Uh, all the paths of edges, uh, other than that particular node, with the uh, shortest number of shortest paths. Yeah, so more formally between centrality is uh, defined as the probability with which right a particular edge appears on the shortest path between any pair of nodes, right. So just to explain that more you take a pair of nodes S comma T, there might you and then you calculate all possible shortest paths between that pair S comma T and there might be some K such uh, shortest paths between S and T. Out of these K uh, shortest paths, how many of them contain that particular node for which you are calculating the between centrality. It can be a node or edge, does not matter. So, out of k, suppose uh, that particular node appears on k1 uh, of shortest paths where k1 is less than k, right. So, then it is between a centrality for that pair will be k1 by k. And how many such pairs would be there in the graph? NC2 pairs. You have to take sum over all such NC2 pairs. So, that would be the uh, between a centrality score for that node. And what is degree centrality? It is just uh, the number of incident edges right, on a particular uh, node. So, that is degree centrality. Uh, and what is closeness centrality? Closeness centrality is for example, given a node, then it is proportional to some of the sh um, shortest paths from that node to every. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, so, it is like closeness centrality is defined as right, inverse of, inverse of the farness of that node. So, take that node as you rightly pointed out, calculate the shortest path distances from that node to all the remaining n minus 1 nodes, take the sum of all such shortest path distances and take inverse of that, right. That will be the closeness centrality. So, <coughs> so for instance here, uh, you, calc you look at uh, node 5 here. So, its closeness centrality is nothing but you look at uh, all possible, uh, uh, I mean from this node 5 to node 4, node 5 to node 2, node 5 to node 1, right, like that 5 to 6, 5 to 10, all uh, uh, the remaining n minus 1 nodes, you calculate the shortest paths from 5 and take sum of that and take inverse of that. So, so that will be uh, 19 and the inverse of that is 1 over 19, right. <coughs> that uh, So, 1 over 19 is the closeness centrality of that node. So, uh, and uh, between centrality just now we have discussed it, right. So, for all ST pairs, you look at all possible shortest paths between S and T pairs and out of those ST short num, S, uh, uh, among those uh, 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 all possible ST shortest paths on how many of them node V appears, right. 
So, that, that ratio is called short um, sum of such ratios for all possible ST pairs is called between a centrality. In other words, the probability with which right a particular node or any, an edge appears on the shortest path between any arbitrary pair of nodes is called between a centrality. That is how you should define. So, <coughs> so for the same uh, uh, running uh, network, you can calculate the between a centralities um, using this formula. <coughs> See for instance for node 5, right? Um, look at any pair of uh, nodes, right? Suppose if that pair is uh, node 1 and node 4, will the shortest path uh, or paths between 1 and 4 contain node 5? No. no. Why? Yeah, because I mean none of them pass through node 5. And uh, what is the property of node 5 in this graph? It is a cut vertex. It is a cut vertex. So, in order to calculate uh, its between a centrality, you can be a bit more smarter in the sense that when you consider a pair of nodes, you select uh, one node in that pair from this side and the other node from the other side, right. So, this is like one part, this is the other part actually. So, this is part 1 and part 2. And uh, ST pairs, yes, you take from here and the T you take from here and form ST pair for all such ST pairs where S is coming from P1 and T is coming from P2, their shortest path must pass through node 5 because 5 is cut vertex. So, how many possibilities are there to choose S? Yes? 4C1 4 and how many possibilities are there to choose T? 5C1 and total how many such ST pairs you can form? 4 into 5 equal to 20, 20 such pairs. For each of those 20 uh, ST pairs, node 5 lies on the shortest path. There can be more than one shortest path, but all of them must pass through node 5. So, that ratio will become 1 by 1 actually. So, for every path, it will add value 1 and how many such ST pairs are there? 20. So, between centrality of node 5 is 20. Right? Like that you can calculate for all the other nodes. It may not be that easy uh, to do like. Uh, oral calculation uh, for any uh, for any node right to calculate the between centrality using this formula so rather uh, uh, you just write a program right which can give you this number okay so so far we have been looking at multiple centrality measures and so on for that same single running network so there are 10 nodes in that network right this 1 to 10 and uh, uh, their cent corresponding centrality measures are mentioned here. So, from this uh, table, so what can you say? Can you infer any information from this table? Any interesting observation? All of them give different results. Of of give different results. <coughs> what does that mean? Yeah, they are giving different results, right? But what does that mean? Translate to uh, some, can you translate that to some semantic meaning? You just observe that, right? So, some centrality measures are uh, uh, keeping some nodes uh, at node 1, I mean top 1 slot and some other ranking mechanisms are pushing some other nodes to the top 1 slot, right? Uh, so, that is one observation. What does that mean? there is no universal ranking mechanism right that uh, according to which a particular node uh, or set of nodes or the influential are most important you change the mechanism accordingly the rankings can change right there, there is no universal way of saying that these are the subset of nodes one should focus nothing like that right it all it depends on is how do you construct how do you formulate the underlying uh, ranking mechanism so, you can uh, formulate a ranking mechanism in such a way that some nodes stand on the top, they take the top slots. I can rather formulate another ranking mechanism wherein possibly all together new set of nodes take the top slots. But I should be able to uh, defend the, uh, the, the need for defining such a ranking mechanism. As long as I can do that, I can, I am like free to use that ranking mechanism and then compute algorithms to calculate that and so on and so forth. So, even though between centrality calculation for instance, right, uh, is, is it like polynomial time algorithm or it is like a hard, hard problem to solve to calculate the between centralities of all the nodes? It is a polynomial uh, time algorithm. 
So, but still, if the graph size is usually large, let's say forget about very uh, uh, huge networks containing millions and billions of nodes, even if you just take a few uh, network containing a few thousands of nodes and a few thousands of edges, and you write a brute force algorithm which takes this two or three uh, nested for loops to calculate as per this expression for between centrality, it takes a lot of time. Even though it is polynomial time algorithm. So you should have like, I'm, I'm just highlighting all these points because computational aspects are most important. Understanding things is conceptual understanding is one aspect of that. And the other side is like, how do you actually write algorithm or algorithms, in particular efficient algorithms, right, to realize these concepts. So there is one popular algorithm, uh, faster co computation of uh, between centrality. It's very, very popular. It runs much faster than several folds uh, faster algorithm compared to the brute force approach. <coughs> so similarly from here, right, there is no single universal ranking mechanism which can say that these are the set of nodes in a given network which should be ranked high. Right? There is nothing of that. You can always design your own ranking mechanism as needed by your application or as needed by your requirements and then work with it. If existing algorithms or machinery are sufficient to calculate or implement that algorithm, it's fine. Otherwise, you have to write new algorithms and that's where new research comes into picture. Right? There are a lot of like uh, several uh, hundreds and even thousands of uh, papers out there in the literature to define which define uh, essentially new ranking mechanisms and then they provide efficient algorithms to ca compute the respective ranking mechanisms. <clears throat> okay, so community detection is another problem. Um, it's like given a large social network, uh, which subset of nodes are strongly connected among themselves and weakly connected to the rest, of, uh, I mean the remaining nodes in the network. So this is called community detection problem. It's also very, very uh, popular and uh, got significant attention in the uh, research community, both computational aspects point of view as well as uh, conceptual point of view. Even these communities can have like uh, multiple properties like, so these communities need not be part, need not be like overlapping. So in a given network, I ask you to partition the graph into let's say K groups in such a way that no part in or no partition um, is like uh, allowed to overlap with other partition. So it's something like this. So your graph is something like this. This is partitioning. So one part, two part, three, four. You are uh, dividing the network into five parts. This is called non-overlapping partition. And overlapping is something like uh, something like this, right? So this part is overlapping with this part. And again, this part is overlapping with this part. This is called overlapping community detection. So the need for these different uh, uh, community detection algorithms, overlapping, non-overlapping, depends on for what purpose uh, you need these things, right? Some references I have provided here for you to uh, go and understand. Um, and a lot of new research is also like emerging. So some of these other tasks I'll skip. Uh, viral marketing anyway in the second talk I will focus on, right? So. Uh, moving on to this graph visualization. So graph visualization, visualization is like a very, very uh, important uh, uh, network analysis task wherein uh, you take some large network, right? And uh, you may want to visualize that network in some uh, level of uh, abstraction. So here uh, it's not a big graph. It contains about a couple of thousands of, not even couple actually, so about thousand nodes and a few thousands of edges. I haven't done anything, I just displayed it. So can you make any sense out of this? Nothing, right? So on the other hand, so uh, is it better than the previous view? Yes. So by looking at this, uh, what I would have done, can you imagine? Community detection. I haven't done anything. I ran some existing community detection algorithm. And for every uh, community, all the members belonging to that community, I gave the same color, right? So then, uh, uh, the visualization is looking much better than the previous scenario, but still it's not that right explainable, right? So look at this. This is uh, way better than the, the previous two visualizations. So here I'm moving to 
the original graph representation to meta level representation wherein every node here corresponds to one community for example this entire community is represented by one node here right and if uh, uh, the, the, there is an edge between these two communities accordingly i'll add an edge between these two communities here like that so because community means all the members in that community share similar characteristics right like minded kind of entities so in order to understand or visualize things we don't need to show each candidate in that like minded community it's enough to show all those collection of like minded entities by one meta entity this is called meta graph as driven by the community detection algorithms so this is like way way better and you can easily sense things out of this if i put uh, or attach some names to this there is the community one this is community two and for each community i know what it means and all right because i know the graph data so then you can make a lot of sense out of this if this graph corresponds to uh, human um, uh, these neurons and their functions how one neuron is connected to the other neuron and things like that so this kind of community structure and meta graph visualization like this gives a lot of information saying that which collection of neurons are interacting with which other collection of neurons what does that mean so we can make more sense out of that by looking at this kind of visualization so there are like a uh, lot of challenges associated with this i just thought of like bringing in this aspect to your notice <coughs> so some of these other ones i'll skip um <coughs> yeah uh, so so in these slides what i'm trying to highlight is uh, so so far we have seen some interesting some uh, collection of uh, problems in uh, network uh, uh, analysis and some of the problems uh, like centrality measures like community detection graph visualization uh, we zoomed a bit and tried to understand what the corresponding problem uh, mean so now i would like to highlight uh, some uh, emerging challenges in this uh, uh, in this area so <clears throat> so the challenges are due to various reasons so here are some important reasons <coughs> availability of auxiliary data so many a times we i mean in order to uh, do any computation over the graph data you should have minimum in terms of how many nodes are there and which pair of nodes are connected with uh, which other pairs of nodes and things like that nodes and edges information minimum you should have apart from that due to the nature of the various applications and so on we also often have availability of auxiliary data in the sense that some tags information right so the edges we can label it with some semantic meanings right and nodes you can attach a lot of uh, attributes to that node saying that name of the node right uh, and then uh, some demographics from what is the place and then age right things like that um, any email id information if you have so that kind of information and any habits that kind of information auxiliary data in other words helps uh, the underlying algorithms to leverage this information and uh, perform better for example if uh, your underlying algorithm uh, the task is to identify let's say uh, behavioral finding behavioral communities the previous community detection thing i told is it's driven by the connection connectivity patterns without any auxiliary data but now i will give connectivity patterns in one hand on the other hand this kind of auxiliary data which consists of uh, let's say demographics of people or their behaviors their actions that they are performing on the top of over and above the link information you have both kinds of information or data in your at your disposal how do you leverage both these pieces of information and then uh, derive uh, behavioral communities for instance there are, those behavioral communities are influenced by both this type of data not just the link information so and then availability of large data sets some part of this i highlighted uh, in the between the centrality computation if your graph grows bigger and bigger even the polynomial time algorithms end up taking significant amount of time which you may not tolerate in real life scenarios so uh, this is uh, i mean this problem is there even for polynomial time algorithms but some of the algorithms are like combinatorial in nature right for example viral marketing which we will see in the next presentation it's a combinatorial optimization problem so such problems are usually uh, computationally hard we call it uh, right np hard problems or np complete problems so obviously we need to uh, design efficient approximation algorithms to tackle such uh, computationally hard problems so 
uh, and uh, again this 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 kind of approximation algorithms uh, become very challenging when data sets grow larger right so then another thing is uh, dynamic nature of uh, network data sets so many a times uh, the structure of network also can change time to time such networks are called temporal networks i think i'll show an example here yeah so consider this is like your original given graph right at time period t1 uh, this is at time period t1 so at time period t2 uh, what has changed this edge is gone if you see right 9 to 13 edge previously it is there in the original graph now it is gone this is t2 suppose for t1 graph uh, you calculate some uh, algorithm output you calculated let's say between central t scores now because being this network is like dynamic some of existing edges uh, may get uh, like severed or removed or new edges may get added anything can happen to make it like dynamic now in this uh, dynamic graph t2 at time period t2 9 and 13 edge is missing right now, do you think the same between centrality scores which you computed for time period T1 hold good here? No. It may not, I mean, you may not need to recalculate for all the nodes. That is the important thing actually. For example, for some of the nodes here, you may not need to recalculate. Whereas, for some pairs of nodes in this, in this region, you may have to recalculate. So, you don't need to restart your algorithm from scratch. Starting from the previous scenario at time period T1, whatever are the outputs between central test scores you have in hand start from there try to adjust them or recalculate only for those required pairs of nodes like this in this partition uh, to capture the network at time period t2 so how do you dynamically update or adjust right your uh, ranking mechanisms given the underlying uh, nature of uh, dynamic nature of the networks you understood right this itself is a research area this is like a real time thing actually so you cannot assume that whatever network you take today and work with it remains the same after several weeks or several months or years uh, for example so we are all part of the scientific community so dblp network right citation network one paper citing the other papers so year on year new papers keep coming and these new papers uh, cite the old papers so new edges uh, keep forming actually. so we have to take that aspect into mind so t1 means up to year 2023 t2 means up to year 2024 so in the 2024 year lot of papers get published and they cite the previous year's papers so your network evolves so this is called the evolution of networks how do you take into account the evolution of network and their characteristics uh, uh, into your computational aspects right I'm stressing on the computational aspects part because, uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that is my one of the interests. <coughs> yeah, here another scenario, this is time period three, T3. So at T2, this edge 9 to 13 edge is missing, right? But at time period T3, new edge is formed between 5 and 9, right? So uh, in this case, again, how do you, starting from the output of time period T2, you have to adjust, you have to recalculate uh, these between centrality scores or any, any output, whatever you would have uh, gotten in time period T2, you have to adjust to this new scenario. In the worst case, you may have to recalculate for all pairs, but you don't need to do that for all pairs. That is the challenge. So how can you leverage the previous information is the most important aspect in these kind of computation problems. <coughs> yeah, so here is one more example. Um, so this is like one stylized network consisting of 13 nodes and about uh, some 11 or 12 edges, right? It's a connected graph, right? So the challenge here is you think of this as like a LAN network where each node represents a computer and uh, connection, each connection represents that two uh, nodes or compute uh, uh, resources are connected with each other. It's just LAN network, very simple. So now assume that uh, none of these uh, nodes or computers are uh, uh, protected uh, with the help of antivirus software. Suppose you don't have uh, sufficient funding to install antivirus software on each of these nodes, but your funding is limited. You have very limited funding, right? Uh, budget B, which is not sufficient to buy 
one copy per this uh, 13 nodes and install it. Rather, this budget is uh, sufficient to install only, let's say, uh, two antivirus softwares, right? So now the question is, which are those two nodes that you identify and install antivirus software such that, right, whenever any virus attacks this LAN network, right, the loss is minimum. What is loss? Whenever, suppose a virus, uh, uh, suppose I install my antivirus software on this node, and a virus, uh, virus can install any node with uniform probability. So there are 13 nodes, right? So each node getting infected, the probability is 1 over whatever, 14, right? 1 over 13, right? So suppose if node 1 uh, gets uh, uh, um, impacted uh, with respect to a particular virus, then that virus can spread to all the nodes that are reachable from that node. So 1 to 2, it will go, it will impact uh, node 2, it will impact node 3, it will impact node 5. And it can't impact node 6 because uh, no, this node, uh, um, this particular node is uh, installed with antivirus software. So the impact of uh, virus, if, it, if, if at all it uh, uh, attacks any of the nodes in this block is uh, 4. It's 4 and the probability of attacking uh, each node is 13. So 4 over 13 is its expected loss arising out of this block. Correct? Like that you can calculate expected loss for that other block also. Take sum of all these blocks. That will be the total expected loss, if at all, a virus in, uh, uh, in, uh, attacks any particular node in the given network. Now the question is, you have to identify those two nodes because your budget is sufficient enough to buy only two antivirus softwares. So now the question is, which two nodes you have to like figure out and then install antivirus software such that the sum of expected losses arising out of each of these components after installing antivirus software right, is minimum. So question is which are the two nodes you have to figure out. So one of the standard ways to do this is uh, uh, you can uh, uh, resort to these existing ranking mechanisms or centrality measures, right? So degree centrality, closeness, betweenness, what not. Whatever you can think of, you can use them and then calculate what are the top two nodes as per that respective a ranking mechanism. So for the sake of uh, uh, completeness, I just uh, included some uh, the top two uh, nodes identified by some standard ranking mechanisms. And uh, you see the first one just to explain. So degree centrality suggests to install antivirus software on node 9 and node 3, right? Uh, between centrality suggests to install antivirus software on node 7 and node 6 or node 7, node 8. That's what it is. But actually, if you, as uh, how I explained, uh, uh, to calculate the expected loss after installing, so for example, between centrality node 7 and node 6, right? Node 7 and node 6, I install antivirus software. Uh, as per the description I gave just now, you can calculate the expected loss arising out of this block and this block and take that sum. So that expected loss will be some number, but it's not optimal. And it is the same situation, the same statement holds for all the remaining ranking mechanisms as well. So none of these existing mechanisms give an optimal solution to solve this problem. So that's where I'm telling actually. So it goes back to one of the slides wherein I showed all the ranking mechanisms, right? None of these things are catering to my need here. So this is one of the scenarios wherein I have to design new algorithms, right? To tackle the, um, the problem in hand. This is an important problem. Existing algorithms are not able to or inadequate to solve this problem. <clears throat> so the solution for this is 4 and 9. 4 and 9 is the optimal solution for this. But you see from the table, there is no ranking mechanism which gives 4-9 four, four, pair. So the optimal uh, uh, loss is like 4 by 13 plus uh, 3 by 13. Uh, plus uh, 4 by 13. Uh, sorry? Yeah, so there is a separate algorithm for that. It's not that uh, straightforward. Uh, so it's like a combinatorial problem because you have to select two nodes out of 13 nodes, right? You are selecting, it's a subset selection problem. It's a combinatorial optimization problem. 
so i'm just uh, trying to give you the uh, the flavor of the computational problems here right uh, i will guide, I, i will direct you to the respective papers if you are interested in right which give you this 4 and 9 it's a separate uh, research problem in itself so for instance we worked on this problem uh, way back 2013 or 14 uh, 14 i think so we had uh, an eca paper um, uh, using game theoretic ranking mechanisms which gave uh, exactly this 4 uh, and 9 outcome and you can as well use some other algorithms as well to generate this kind of output but we used uh, uh, game theoretic approach to solve that i'm getting into uh, that game theoretic side uh, that's the reason i would like to highlight some of these things okay okay so <clears throat> um with this so i'll just uh, uh, i think this is the right time for me to give motivation for uh, uh, game theoretic ranking mechanisms but uh, before that uh, a few resources i'll keep these presentation slides available to you uh, these are all like not very very recent but very fundamental references some important textbooks in this area some important leading researchers right and uh, then uh, uh, some data sets and repositories if you want to work in this area so the first one and second one are most like popular ones especially the first one from stanford university uh, they are like regularly updating uh, their uh, web page with data sets and uh, uh, frameworks uh, to conduct uh, network analysis and these are some tools uh, to conduct network analysis gephi uh, is one of the popular ones even graphviz <clears throat> and then here are some list of important conferences wherein you can find relevant papers in this area and you yourself do some interesting piece of work you can target some of these conferences to publish that piece of work and uh, here are some important journals right i'm just uh, flashing fast because uh, these slides will be available uh, for you to access so let me get into with this this is the right place for me to get into the game theoretic aspects uh, why game theoretic aspects are important in the first place right so limit <clears throat> what are the so for that right you need to understand what are the limitations of existing approaches right so don't think that all the existing mechanisms are like inadequate and this is the only way to do this no it's only a class of problems right for which existing approaches uh, are Uh, inadequate or insufficient to tackle that class of problems wherein we can use game theoretic algorithms in a natural way that's what it is right don't think that for each and every problem we can do this not uh, that's not correct actually okay so but some of these existing uh, these facts whatever i wrote here are important facts right so i'll just uh, go through them the common phenomenon of the standard centrality measures is that they assess importance of each node by focusing only on the role played by that node if it is a node centric or edge centric algorithms any of these between centrality you take the calculation of between centrality node focuses a particular node and then uh, right using that expression we have seen right uh, it uh, considers all pairs of other nodes and uh, look at uh, their uh, shortest paths and how many of them this particular node appears so the focus will be only on that node to calculate the centrality measure or ranking uh, uh, ranking of that node but uh, many a times it may not be the case your influence right the calculation of your influence uh, should also consider the uh, group effects uh, wherein you are a member of that group right i will come to that group effects thing <clears throat> so such an approach is inadequate to capture the synergies that may occur when groups of nodes is considered that's what i'm trying to say so not only your own individual influence we should focus on but also your influence as a group of other nodes should also be like taken into account when calculating your own influence you are meaning that uh, you being a node or an edge <coughs> so with that backdrop i will give two three examples to highlight the group effect right not only the individual nodes effect plus that individual nodes effect as a group right so consider a team of uh, employees and a set of projects so uh, there are like three employees e1 e2 e3 and v is a value function which attaches a score to each of these employees based on 
their ability to execute certain projects. Suppose there are three projects, right? So the three projects require different set of uh, skills. So for instance, um, I'll just write down here. So P1 may require, let's say, skill one, uh, skill three, and uh, skill four, right? And the project P2 may require skill 2, skill 3, and skill 5, right? Something like that. And the project P3 also has a collection of skills. On the other hand, these employees, right? So E1 can have a set of skills. Let's say E1 has uh, what skills I can write? E1 has, uh, let's say, S1, S3, S4, and S7 skills, right? And E2 uh, can have. Uh, S2, S3, uh, S5, uh, S6 skills, right? So now, uh, and similarly E3, E3 also has similarly another set of uh, skills. Now you look at uh, the each of these individual employees and their available skill sets and the set of projects and the required skill sets by the projects. Now the value of each employee is nothing but, right? How many projects individually E1 can execute? Using these skill sets, E1 can execute project P1. He can E1 cannot execute project P2 because P2 requires uh, S2 skill, which is not required, which is not available with E1. Right? He cannot execute uh, P2. Right? Is this clear? Okay. So following this kind of setup, the value of uh, employee one is one. He can alone execute only one project. Similarly, for employee 2, he can alone execute only one project, namely P2, right? Uh, for example, how E2 has S2, S4, S, S3, S5, and S6 skills, and P2 requires S2, S3, S5, so E2 can execute that. But E2 cannot execute P1, project P1, because it requires S1 skill, which is not available with uh, employee 2. So employee 2 cannot execute project P1. For the similar reasons, he can also he also cannot execute project P3. You can write down some skills and uh, get that. Right? Not difficult. And uh, employee three. So for the sake of completeness, um, employee three cannot execute any project. So how can write uh, some skills here? S1, S2, S3 are required skills for project P3. And employee three has let's say S1 and S4, for instance. So using S1 and S4 skills. Employee 3 cannot execute any project, right? It's very clear. Now, on the other hand, E1 and E2, if you three, if you consider E1 and E2, they can execute three projects. All P1, P2, P3. How? So P1 requires S1, S3, S4. So now E1 and E2 together you see union of the skills of these two employees, right? S1, S3, S4 is there. S1, S2, S4. So they can execute P1. And P2, S2, S3, S5, S2, S3, uh, S5 is here. They can execute the second project. And third project requires S1, S2, S3. So S1, S2, S3. They can execute all three projects together as a group. That is the most important thing. Now, if you see, the value of E1 is 1. Value of E2 is 1. When you take the group E1 and E2, it's not 1 plus 1. It's more than that, actually, it's three. This is called synergy effect as a group. Now, when you want to calculate the influence of employee E1, don't stop your analysis by looking at E1 itself, right? That only gives you the information that is encapsulated in this first line. Whereas, if you look at the group information also, the synergy effect, that's what uh, I was talking here, right? The synergy effect, the group effects, right? So this line captures the group effect part. So consider both individual effects as well as the group effects and aggregate this piece of information arising out of these two individual and group effects to actually calculate the influence score for individuals. That's the main message I would like to convey. I hope it is clear. I'll give one more example as well, but this is the main message. What, what do you mean by groups? But again, I'm not getting into the computational aspect so far. I'm trying to explain you only the conceptual thing. When you want to get into the computational aspects, which is most important, um, is it like easy to uh, uh, calculate the group effects? If there are n 
individuals or n employees in this case, right? If there are n employees and your focus is a particular employee n i, so there are like uh, n minus 1 other employees out there, right? How many groups you can consider? Groups of size 2, groups of size 3, groups of size 4, right? Groups of until n minus 1 size. It's like combinatorial, right, problem. n minus 1 c2, n minus 1 c3, n minus 1 c4. These are all groups of various sizes, right, uh, to which you can attach this particular node i and see its group effect and do some aggregation. It can be simple summing across all these groups or some function of the group size, whatever. That depends on your calculation actually and your requirement, algorithm details. So, it becomes like this, these are all like examples of combinatorial problems as, as and when subsets of entities come into picture in your algorithm, it becomes combinatorial problem. Usually these combinatorial problems are hard in a brute force manner. Maybe if you think carefully for some scenarios depending on what is this value function, this is most important, this v function, how exactly you define this v function may give you an edge in terms of defining or uh, proposing efficient polynomial term algorithms. Even though in general they are hard to calculate, but the nature of that value function v may give you an edge to define efficient algorithms, right? So that is the computational aspects, but conceptually this is what it is. I will give one more example. Uh, <coughs> yeah, this, this I told, right? So, the 4 and uh, 9 are the set of a pair of nodes to install antivirus software to minimize the expected loss when a virus uh, attacks this particular LAN network. Again, calculating this, uh, this pair 4 and 9, uh, so um, I mean we have uh, developed a game theoretic approach, uh, some of the gist I will cover in the rest of the 4 or 5 slides, right? It gives the optimal solution for this example. Yeah. So, look at another uh, scenario between a centrality. <coughs> so, again I told right, so the traditional between a centrality algorithm focuses only on a particular individual node, right? That is what is this definition. We have seen this. But now what I will show now is different. So, calculation of between a centrality as per the proposal I am uh, trying to explain to you is focus on that node's individual effect plus focus on its group effect also. That is called group between a centrality. That is the ideal centrality measure you should ideally like target for. So, how? Uh, look at this network, right? I am going beyond the traditional thing. This is the traditional thing. This is the example we calculated, right? Node 5 is cut vertex and it between centrality is 20. We have seen all that. So, now I am going one step forward, right? The group between a centrality thing. How? So, look at these two nodes, V1 and V2, right? The standard between a centrality or the classical between a centrality as per this expression is same for these two nodes, V1 and V2 nodes. Why? Because they are structurally similar with respect to uh, each other. Uh, you, you see, there are four neighbors here, four neighbors there, here four neighbors. And again, even though these four neighbors are not directly connected to V2, but V1 and V2, there is a one on one connection actually. It is equivalent to that all these things are also conceptually connected to this. You can think of that way. So, that is the reason if you sit and calculate their between centralities V1 and V2 between centralities will be one and the same. All right. But it is not the ideally, it should not be the case. The between centrality of centralities of these two nodes should not be same. Why? The reason is uh, given here. Uh, so, consider the roles that these two nodes play as groups now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I would like to read this so that you will understand this very carefully. A significant percentage of shortest paths controlled by V2, look at V2, are also controlled by V3, right? So, whatever is the, uh, I mean, set of shortest paths that V2 controls, majority of them are also controlled by V3, right? Number of shortest paths controlled by group V2, V3, V2, V3 is much smaller than the group V1 and V3, this group. 
I am trying to focus on the group effects now. If you consider these two groups, V2, V3, V1, V3. So, V2, V3, right? So, previously what I made, the top lines made a statement that between centralities of V1 and the V2 are one and the same as per the traditional centrality measure. Now, I am trying to bring in the group effects. I attach V3 for this, for this node. I attach V3 for V2. I am now trying to see the group effect, right? So, without groups, these two, uh, I mean V1 and V2 have same between centrality. Now, I just appended V3 to V1 and V3 to V2. Now, in this group language, what happens is, the set of shortest paths that are controlled by V2 and V3 is way, way lesser than V1 and V3. Why? Because independently, whatever shortest paths V2 controls, majority of them are also controlled by V3 because they are next to each other. But whereas, if you look at uh, the set of shortest paths independently controlled by V1 and V3 are way different. There is not much overlap. That's the reason when you consider the group thing, this group V1 and V3 group controls way significantly larger number of shortest path than this group. Now, what can you understand from this? By adding V3 to V2 versus V3 to V1, size is only 2, but the value of these sizes, in other words, the number of shortest paths controlled by that combination versus this combination is very different. But independently, V1 and V2 controls the same number of shortest paths. Now, the group effect is bringing this difference. And when you consider this group effect and calculate, right, what will happen? V1 gets higher score, V2 gets lesser score. You understood this? V1 gets more score. Because uh, independently V1 and V2 between centrality is same, meaning that the number of shortest paths they control is one and the same independently. Now, the group effect you consider, I am not looking at all groups. I am just looking at a sample group wherein V1 and V3 are here. I append, uh, sorry, V1 and V2 are here. I append V3 to V1 and again I append V3 to V2. Right? Sizes of 2. Right? By I am adding the same node V3 to each of these two nodes, V1 and V2, and make them size 2 sets. So, this the number of shortest paths controlled by this set is way significantly higher than this set. So, which means that what the marginal contribution uh, of V1, um, right, being individual versus being group is higher than V2. That's what it is. That aspect we need to bring into picture. So, there might be so many other combinations, that's fine, but this combination itself brings significant difference between v, the role played by V1 and V2, right, V1 and V2 as groups. There might be some other groups also wherein this effect might be more and more, but this group is an example illustration or certificate to say that, right, uh, V1 has more, uh, V1 should be given more weightage or more power in the group between centrality calculation. This is only conceptual thing. Again, you have to consider all possible subsets and for each subset, what is the value? All that you have to calculate. The computational aspects will come later. There are papers on this. There are papers on this which are published in discrete math journals. So in this case, the value function to be number of shortest path passing to that group? Yes, as a group actually. You should not distinguish individual nodes in that. As a group, you just tie them together. It's just a meta thing, meta node for you. Any shortest path that passes through this, you just count it. Just like how you have done the standard between centrality focusing on individual nodes, right? Repeat that kind of thing, focusing all the nodes inside that group as like tied together and a meta node. Same conceptually similar thing, but with groups. So there are research papers on this, okay? <coughs> So, you, you are understanding, right, what is the common thing between the previous example and this example? The previous example here, so yeah, huh. yes, yes, I am coming. In this also, the group effect I highlighted, right, first example. This is the second example. Again, group effect I highlighted, what is the optimal size of two, right, nodes, wherein you have to install antivirus software, right, it is a group thing. Even in this between centrality, group between centrality aspect I am highlighting. 
again right the ideal way of calculating between incidental risk scores is by considering not only individual nodes but also their group effects so i am i think by now it is like uh, i mean might have been like clear in your mind that group effects play significant role you have to bring in the group effects into picture while you uh, design your ranking mechanisms that is summary yeah please uh, some question yeah Yeah, both in the group thing, both uh, V2, V3 as a group, how many shortest paths they control, that is their value. Value of V2 and V3, right? And similarly, value of V1 and V3. Mm-hmm. So they don't have, they don't flow through V1 or V3 themselves. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, can you label the vertices in here? Can you label the vertices? Yeah, yeah, so I can label. One, mm. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? Uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. So when you consider for V1, V3 as a group, mm -hmm. 9 to 5 is an option? 9 to 5. Or it should flow to V3 as well. Not necessary, yeah, it's a good question actually. 9 to 5 passes through V1, out of this V1, V3 group, you count it. So it's now V1, V3 is a single node. Uh, you don't need, I mean, that like shortest like path need not go through both actually. So it's not like only 9 and 13, you need, you can 9 and 4, 4, 9, 5. Yeah, yeah. so 9 and 5 contributes to its value uh, for v, V1 and V3, 9, 5 contributes, 9, 13 contributes, 9, 14, like that, yeah. Like it go through both. Yeah. No, need not be any one or both, doesn't matter. It should touch that subset, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, here is the uh, big picture how you can achieve this. This is where uh, I mean, uh, we propose the game theoretic solution. So, what is uh, uh, game theoretic solution? So, I will not get into uh, the game theoretic notions in general and all. So it's a, like uh, a mathematical uh, subtopic, right? Um, in that there are like in, in game theory there are two branches: cooperative game theory and non-cooperative game theory. We especially make use of cooperative game theoretic solutions. So what cooperative game theoretic solutions in general do is, so usually there are like uh, n players, n1, n2, etc. Uh, so there are n players, right? For every so in cooperative game theory, what will happen is this is the framework. So there will be a value function v. It is a set function, right? Which takes uh, I mean which is defined as uh, which is defined for all possible subsets, right? So this value function v uh, takes any subset of players and attaches a value, right? So, V of uh, one example can be V of uh, n1, comma, uh, n3. For this subset, the value can be 2, right? So, V of uh, uh, n3, n7, n9 can be, let's say, some 4 or some 4.5. It, it need not be integers, actually. It can be a floating point or whatever. So, it, it attaches a value from the uh, real valued numbers, actually, right? So, V is... Uh, uh, a set function and uh, the cooperative game theoretic solutions uh, what they finally do is they derive a score right for every node there are every node are a player if there are n players they attach uh, so cooperative game theoretic techniques cgt cooperative game theoretic techniques they take this value function as input right inside cooperative game theoretic techniques this is the algorithmic box Right? It takes the value function as input and emits a score right? for each node. Score for n1, score for n2, score for nth player. This is the basic construction. Set function is, uh, the, the, the v is the set function. And uh, this is where the complexity lies because for all possible subsets of the players, you have to define the value. That's where the combinatorial aspect comes into picture. 
and the algorithmic aspect is uh, there are many popular algorithms that exist in the CGT box computational game theoretic techniques. Exam the popular examples include uh, Shapley value algorithm, right? Uh, so core, right? So there are some uh, popular uh, solution concepts or algorithms out there which uh, fill in this this box here. Depending on your requirements, problem context in nature, you appropriately choose some algorithm and uh, keep it in this box and uh, you, you have to define this value function depending on your application and which goes as input to this that particular algorithm and it emits a score. This is the output. So this is the input. This is the algorithm. Right. So with this backdrop, I will just explain the same things. So we have the set of players and the problem context using which you define the value function. Examples uh, meaning that the employees and the projects con concept, right? The value function v of e1 is 1, v of e2 is 1, v of e1 and e2 is 3, that is the value function, right? It attaches a value to every subset of players and which goes as input to the solution concepts or your algorithm piece. Examples I wrote here already, Shapley value, core, etc. And the output of this algorithm is a score for every player, like I mentioned already. So this algorithm is like usually hot uh, computationally due to the nature of the input, right? If your value function, this V function takes some specific forms or it has some specific structure, only in those scenarios, right? Computation of algorithm A is polynomial. Otherwise, it is computationally hard problem. You need to define or devise efficient alg approximation algorithms or some kind of Monte Carlo MCMC based sampling algorithms depending on your need. This is the overall construct. <coughs> so I'm just giving an example, right? So a cooperative game is defined using, it's a bit more formalism uh, defined by a pair. Co I told, right, these algorithms are coming out of cooperative game theory, CGT. So I'm just defining what uh, cooperative game theory means a bit more formal way. So it is a pair n comma v where n is the set of players, right? And v is a value function, you know, set function for every set of subset of players it attaches a score. And by definition, v of empty set is zero. Okay. Here is an example, right? There are three players, s, b1 and b2. S is the seller, b1 and b2 are buyers. It's just like a trading setting and uh, there is a product uh, which is like owned by a seller and there are two potential buyers B1 and B2 and B1 and B2 uh, and the seller S yes, wants to sell that item for 10 rupees, right? That is that seller's valuation on that product. Whereas the two buyers value the product uh, at 15 and 20 rupees or 20 units, 15 and 20 units respectively. Now with these numbers in hand, you can define a cooperative game like this, where n is the set of players, seller and both the buyers form the set of players. And the value function you see, value of individual set, individual player, only seller is there in that group, any transaction takes place? No transaction, right? Its value is zero. If only either of the two buyers are there, again, no transaction takes place, value is zero. And if only both buyers are there, Again, no seller is present in that group, right? No transaction takes place, again, value zero. And these are the, the bottom three the subsets are most interesting. So yes, B1 pair, transaction can happen with S and B1 pair. Then what is the value? Value is nothing but S wants, S values the product at 10, B1 values the product at 15. Margin is what? 15 minus 10. Bargaining happens with respect to this five, right? So that is the value. So we need to distribute this value to the con con corresponding two players. So when the bargaining happens and the deal is cut at 13, what it means? Out of five, three units are going to the seller, 13, right? Because seller values it at 10, he is getting three out of this five and buyer is getting two out of that five. That's what intuitively you can think. And SB2 is 10 because uh, S values it at 10 and uh, buyer two values, it, uh, values this at 20, the gap is 10, right? 10 is the space where bargaining takes place and the, the third most important one is the, the grand correlation. We call a correlation or a subset as grand correlation if it contains all the players. In this case only three players are there. Value of all the three players, S, B1, B2 is nothing but 
is nothing but the maximum value that we can generate. In this case, the maximum uh, surplus between seller and the buyer's valuations when a transaction takes place. So, what kind of two tra possible transactions can take place? SB1 transaction or SB2? Which has more surplus? SB1 has 5 surplus. SB2 has 10 surplus, which is more 10, right? So, the valuation of this grand correlation is 10. So, this gives a clear cut example of how to define a value function V. So, for your scenarios, right, accordingly you have to define a V function. This is a simple example, toy example to illustrate the concept. So, we directly wrote the numbers here 0, 5, 10, like that. But in general, this value function you can define using some functional form, right? So, which is like a, a function over the set of players. So, <coughs> Uh, and finally, whatever is the score vector that you derive, right? So, this thing for every player, one score we derive. That score vector should satisfy. So, score vector, let's call x1, x2, etc., xn. This is the score vector which is like output by the algorithm. The score vector should satisfy some properties. What are those uh, uh, properties actually? Some of the scores of um, some of the scores. Uh, okay, let me look at this. Uh, okay, the score vector we also call this as like payoff allocation. So, if there are n players, uh, it attaches n scores, right? Some of all these scores should be uh, x1 plus x2 plus etc. xn should be equal to value of n. Value of n is nothing but the value of the grand correlation. In this case, in this example, value of grand correlation is uh, 10. So, here the output vector is x1 plus uh, x1 comma x2 comma x3. Any algorithm generates this uh, three dimensional vector, right? Sum of all these three dimensions should be 10. That is one property. And sum of any two dimensions, suppose if you take these two dimensions, x1 plus x2 should be less than or equal to, which subset is this? 1, 2 subset, right? 1, 2 subset meaning that suppose if you give 1 and 2, 3 names to this S, B1 and B2, 1, 2 subset is this. So, X1 plus X2 should be less than or equal to 5. And 2, 3 subset X2 plus uh, X3 should be less than or equal to 2, 3 subset uh, is this, right? 0. And uh, X1 plus X3 subset is this, should be less than or equal to 10. These are the constraints that should be satisfied by this vector that you generate. I am just formally capturing that using like this. So, in the vector that we generate x1, x2, etc. up to xn, it should satisfy conditions like this. Uh, for any correlation C, you take sum of those xi vectors where i belong to C, that sum should be less than or equal to value of that correlation. Correlation meaning or the group. Those things I just uh, elaborated here. This is one value of C, this is another value of C, this is another value of C. <coughs> okay. Um, so, I should show this. Um, so, I have been like talking about Shapley value and all. This is the expression to calculate Shapley values of all the players given the value function. This is a closed form expression and uh, it takes sum over all possible subsets of the players excluding i. Suppose for node player i you want to calculate Shapley value, exclude that player i and take all possible subsets of the remaining players, right? And for every subset of the players, you attach node i and you do not attach node i. What is the gap in their value functions, right? This is called marginal value. marginal value uh, of i player i to which subset c. How many such subsets you can take? These many such subsets you can take. <coughs> you can think of this as a normalization constant. Conceptually, it boils down to this. The Shapley value of a particular player is nothing but the average marginal contribution of that player to any arbitrary subset of players. This is the marginal contribution part and you are just uh, giving a weight to that. What is this weight? How many ways you can choose C? The typical 
permutation combination thing nothing special about that but this in a brute force manner as per this expression here this closed form expression here it's a hard problem because you need to loop over all possible subsets of size uh, uh, n minus 1 right that's where it's computationally hard but if you are again i'm repeating if your value function takes a particular specific form then it can become polynomial time algorithm you don't need to repeat over all possible things some interesting thing you can do and it's just like take some of this this that and so on you are done that depends on the underlying problem let's not worry about for which problems this exists and for which problems this cannot happen and so on but this is the gist of things yeah so for the previous example this example right the seller and the trading setting here this this setting here i just uh, applied the shapley value this expression and the shapley value scores for player 1 um, turns out to be 200 player 1 is the seller player 2 is buyer 1 and player 3 is buyer 2 so buyer 1 and buyer 2 have uh, equal shapley values 50 and 50 and player 1 has higher shapley value 200 that is because without seller no transaction takes place and uh, right something like that so you can use this expression and calculate Uh-huh. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry. So this is example, different example. I think it's not the same example. I'm sorry for that, actually. Yeah. But you can calculate exactly following this. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, it's a good point, Amit, you are raising. So here, uh, uh, Shapley value of seller, Shapley value of buyer 1, uh, Shapley value of buyer 2. So Shapley value of buyer 1 and buyer 2 won't be same. Okay, because their valuations are different. Yeah, I'm sorry for that, but yeah, these Shapley values are for this value function. Yeah, you can feed in any any value function and then get that. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so I think uh, uh, this is what I wanted to uh, bring in. Uh, uh, is this clear? The specifics of for a particular scenario, how exactly you do? Uh, I mean, you can read papers and get it actually, but the conceptual part I would like to bring in uh, to your notice and uh, 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 to make it like uh, um, uh, usable, right, in different scenarios, you should understand what is the fundamental thing behind it, right. So this is the main thing. See, the group effect, right, the synergy effect, group of not only the individual effects of nodes, but also group effect of uh, effects of the nodes, you should consider while designing your ranking mechanisms. That is one line takeaway of this entire session. So not many or uh, not all the existing algorithms consider this aspect. Depending on uh, your scenario, your algorithm, uh, your scenario, your problem context in hand, right? You have to like bring in this. Some cases it is meaningful, some cases it may not be meaningful. So you should be cognizant about that fact. So in what scenarios it is important, for what scenarios it is not important. The between centrality thing to my surprise 2013 or 2014 um, there is one journal paper and a couple of conference papers followed by a journal paper came in. I was really surprised, oh between centrality problem is solved what these people are again doing. When I just uh, scanned through the titles of the papers then I thought oh let me read them. When I started reading those papers so the motivating example I showed there. Um, is uh, taken from those papers actually. Uh, this one. This one is taken from uh, those papers. So it's like everything you can redefine in, in a sense conceptually. Uh, but only for some scenarios you can attach semantic meaning to that. In some cases you may not need to attach semantic, I mean it may not be possible to attach semantic meaning. In that case, you don't need to worry. If it is important and possible to attach semantic meaning in the scenarios uh, that you care or you need to tackle, then consider it. Then existing algorithms may not suffice. Between centrality is one example, right? Standard between centrality calculation is not sufficient, inadequate. They have defined a new algorithm. It's a combinatorial setting, more harder problem than the previous scenario. And they wrote like uh, some papers. That's how research progresses. All right. Okay, so if there are no questions, we will take a break here.